Hello and welcome back to the Sausage Curve. My name's John and we're going to discuss two giant fat elephants in the corner of the room today. Um, we're going to discuss the super duper fast motor base Fords, uh, Napa Racing UK. And we're going to discuss the track limit saga which seems to be kind of ongoing throughout all levels of British motorsport since they've been brought in. So we'll dive straight into this. Um, I'm going to go straight to a web page, which is a piece by Marcus Simmons in the Autosport magazine. Well, the Autosport website. So he's saying that the national motorsport track limits mess that needs to be cleaned up. He says his opinion is that when the proposed revision of track limit regulations was declared across the nas UK national motorsport, it was met with poor reception. He is right there. The situation was arguably worsened even before its official instalment and a new course of action is desperately needed. I can't disagree with Marcus. Um, he usually does write some very good pieces, and, you know, it has came. this story has basically started rumbling um, because the highest profile event really in British motorsport that we've seen thus far with the track limits is this great battle that we saw between Ash Sutton and Ricky Collard. And Ricky Collard was looking for his maiden victory in the British Touring Cars, and we'll just read on and we'll see a little bit more of this. But he's saying, there's something going very wrong in British motorsport. The trigger to write in this column is the fallout from Ricky Collard being denied his maiden victory in the British Touring Car Championship at Brands Hatch, following a thrilling race against three-time champion Ash Sutton. But Collard, whose crime was multiple breaches of track limits, is only part of a worrying bigger picture. Now, some people will say, that's the rules, John. Track limits are track limits. If you abuse them, you will be... You'll be in trouble, you'll, get, you'll be penalised, you'll lose your victory. Um, you've used that to gain an advantage and you'll lose your victory. But my opinion is that the policing or the consistency of the implementation of these rules is worryingly out of, completely out of touch with the motorsport that I'm watching. Um, he goes on to say that there were six race meetings in the UK last weekend, including three that were headlined by some of our most prestigious series, including the British Touring Cars at Brands Hatch, the British GT Championship at Silverstone, and the TCR UK Championship at Croft. Across those three events, there were no fewer than 10 races where the on-the-road winner was given a penalty, and in one case was excluded. In nine of the 10 that we've just discussed, that resulted in a driver who hadn't crossed the line first being awarded the victory. The exception being Janetta Juniors at Silverstone, where Freddie Slater was given track limits penalties in two races, but in one of them had pulled out sufficient gap to still be the winner. Now, for me, it's just not the way motorsport should be. You, When you're watching motorsport, it can be confusing enough with lapped cars and the amount of cars on track to know who's winning what. And, you know, you're cheering at the side. It's a little bit like VAR in football. When a goal goes in, everyone cheers. It's a goal. Then VAR steps in and rightly or wrongly, allows it or chops it off but it just knocks the wind out your sails when you're watching these events live the penalties weren't all for on track all for track limits among them were false starts overtaking behind safety car and gaining advantage by contact with a rival so it's a little bit spurious in there i suppose the column isn't disputing that any of those penalties were in, entirely justified and correct but together they build up a grim picture and let's put it another way, if you're a motorsport enthusiast shelling out around £100, including petrol and food, to take your family for a day out of the track, you deserve to enjoy that day and for what's happening on track in front of you to be the be-all and end-all. Now, this is where I, of course, agree. I think what you see on the track is kind of what you've paid for. Um, and what are the track limits achieving you know the majority of the cars that we've discussed above and the nature of the tracks that we race at in britain generally you don't achieve too much by going across grass or trying to cut corners ridiculously because you choke up all your radiators etc and generally overheat and ruin your car and ruin your whole weekend i can see why some of the track limits you can implement them but it's too grey and I still don't think we've got enough officials in the United Kingdom or around these tracks and we can't afford them in order to make this, you know, some sort of perfect solution to track limits. Um, Ricky Collard being the number one that I can think of, obviously. Um, 
but also Max Coates, he went into a lot of detail um, at the weekend of himself being penalised with track limits in the Porsche, in the Porsche Cup, um, when he was furious at the fact that the guys in front of him were clearly taking an identical or worse line than him. So it's just consistency. We want consistency in the sport. I want consistency in all sport. Um, whether you're going to implement a rule such as this when you're not ready for it or whether you're going to just allow it to racing to be racing. I want to know your opinion on this because that's quite a it's quite a big thing and it's going to it's going to rumble on believe me um, it's going to rumble on throughout the season and if the season is close at the end I know the next subject kind of goes away from anyone thinking it's going to be a close season but if it is going to be a close season in the end, who wants a title to be decided on track limits really when, you know, these people are pushing the boundaries and limits of the cars? So I'd like to know your opinions on that. So let us know. Now we're going to quickly round up the results, which I missed off because I've been ill. I was ill a couple of weeks ago and then I was away for a weekend. So basically the results, as you will all know, at Brands Hatch, We'll just quickly fly through them because I don't want to take too long because you guys will more or less know what's happened. But Ash Sutton, we'll go backwards since this is where I've started. Ash Sutton won race three. Um, there is your top ten there. Some, the usual suspects kicking about there. Tom Chilton's doing well this season. Adam Morgan's competing with the best of his teammates with Colin Turkington in there. And Bobby Thompson's doing absolutely exceptional in his Cupra there at brands race two obviously the race before that ash sutton again the reason i'm showing you this is because there's going to be a bit of a running theme here um i've seen a lot of attacks on ash sutton online um and i've had a lot of defense of him on itv when i watched it on the television so i just kind of want to sum up my point of view on that and see what your guys opinions are on it also so obviously ash sutton was up there tom ingram's still there and uh, race one uh, Colin Turkington won that one, but I believe Ash Sutton did start. No, he didn't. He started way back there in fourth, but you can see Cavish dropped back a bit. So yeah, it was a good mix up at Brands Hatch. Some good racing. Um, track limits obviously was the talk of the day there, which we've just discussed. Moving on to Snetterton, which we've just had. It's just fresh in the memory. Another fantastic race weekend for me to watch. It was brilliant. Um, Ash Sutton. Sorry, it's just loading up this page. Ash Sutton converted his pole position into race one win. Tom Ingram dropped a few places there. Jake Hill managed to barge his way through, shoulder his way through, I should say, um, up into second place with Colin Tuckington in third place. So there's your top ten for race one. Aaron Taylor Smith getting there at the top ten, which was an impressive race for him. Um, the, the Power Max racing cars actually look pretty competitive this year. Rory Butcher, ninth. Um, the best of the Toyotas, I believe. And Josh Cook in eighth, which I think is his best finish so far of the season. Correct me if I'm wrong, of course. Uh, race two. Ash Sutton again wins. So you're seeing a running theme here. Um, Ash Sutton wins again. Um, this, this, of course, this weekend at Snetterton, they had to use three compounds, the all three compounds of the tyres. The soft, medium and hard. Um, and Ash Sutton managed to race and win race one and two. And it was almost impossible for him on the hard tyres for race three to win. But as you'll see, he just still got a strong finish. Uh, Jake Hill second, Colin Tucker the third. And Adam Morgan, Dan Rowbottom, Stephen Jelly, Tom Ingram, Rory Butcher, Sam Osborne and Dan Lloyd finishing out the top 10 for race two. So Dan Lloyd having a strong finish in his Cupra. Race three, I think, was a little bit... I think Dan Lloyd got knocked off, if I can remember correctly. Tom Ingram, feeling like rubbish, managed to get his way to the front on the different tyres. This is where we're seeing... It was a really good race, actually, because you got to see not only the reverse grid, but you saw a jumbled up difference in the compound of tyres people were using. Um, so we saw Tom Ingram, Rory Butcher, Dan Robom and Ash Sutton managing to finish fourth on the hard tyre. Which we'll talk about in a minute. Josh Cook, his best finish, he think he made up a ridiculous amount of places, like 20 odd places, um, to finish in fifth position there. Um, Stephen Jelly in a solid sixth, Tuckington seventh, Aidan Moffat with a, one of his best finishes of the season, I think, in eighth. 
um, starting to get to grips with that car. Morgan in ninth and Jake Hill 10th. I think he slipped wide. He had a bit of an argy bargy with the BMWs, which we are going to also speak about. That could be elephant number three in the room, couldn't it? The BMWs and their tactics. So, yeah, plenty to discuss. Let us know what you thought of the weekend. Were you there? Did you enjoy watching it on television? Sorry I didn't do a watch along. I've just been so busy since um, in the last few weeks. So I will continue to do these previews or reviews um, if we're not doing watch alongs. But I really want to do a watch along to see who comes along and joins in. So the main discussions really are around this. Let's see if I can get the series BTCC. Hmm. Yep, there we are, BTCC. Well, let's just jump in straight to that. I thought it might have gave us the overall stand-ins, so I might just jump back to this. BTCC.net, bear with me. And um, that's praising basically Josh Cook's um, comeback there. Absolutely, we've got 10 days until Throxton. So they seem to be coming thick and fast, um, or too thick and fast for me, uh, basically. Let's see if they have updated their standings. I'm not 100% sure if they have, but everyone is talking about Ash Sutton just now. Everybody's saying that the Napa Racing Ford's too quick, it's overboosted. Um, there must be something dodgy going on. And that basically that Miss Sir Alan Gow wants, for some reason, Ashley Sutton to win the championship. Now, first of all, I just want to kind of say that out loud to, to see how stupid it sounds. Because why on earth would a championship owner or owner of Toka or whoever want a single driver to run away with the championship? Uh, that's just number one. Anybody. No matter who you support, Alan Gow has kind of prided himself on the BTCC being a very, very, very close championship where the balance of performance is balanced so that we see the best of the drivers. So I'll leave that to your opinion just now. But what I just want to show you quickly is the timing zones for the Snetterton circuit because this was something that Tim Harvey brought up on... Um, just see if I can get rid of that. Yep. This is something that Tim Harvey brought up while we were watching it, which I agree and slightly disagree with his well, I can see ways around it. But this is the basically a finish line. FL. This is your first sector here before Agostini, and this is your second sector here down the back of the Bentley Straight. So we can look at that sector two. You would expect that to be the quickest off the back of the Bentley Straight before you start breaking into Brundle. And if we look at the timing here, you'll see that Intermediate 2, they're hitting about 144, 145 mile an hour. And Intermediate 1, they're hitting about 123, 124 mile an hour. And at the finish line, they're hitting about 131 mile an hour. So that, that tells you the speed traps for these cars. Now, just to poo-poo the fact that Ashley Sutton's in some kind of super fast top end uh, focus with nitrous oxide in it. He's actually 12th quickest through Intermediate 1 on the speed trap. He was 17th quickest uh, Intermediate 2 through the speed trap. And where was he? He was 15th quickest through the speed trap um, at the finish line. So let's see if this is consistent. That was race 1, sorry, round 7, race 1 of the day. We can see again Sutton, 13th. Uh, where are we again? Let's see if we can find him. He's not even on this one. I think he's further down. Yep, he's further down. He's not even on. He's down there. He's down in 23rd for the speed trap for race two. And at the finish line, again, he's not even in the top 20, is he? Let's have a quick little look. No, it looks like he is down here in 26th. So I think we could quite, and this is on the hard tyre for race three, or round nine, um, and we can see that, where is it? He's struggling to find him this time, John, I should have done that. Eighth quickest in the speed trap there. I mean, this is going to be a jumbled mess because you had hard, softs and mediums all in the same race. Um, through the second one, um, you can see that he was down here somewhere. 
And the third one is down here somewhere at the finish line. So that quickly poo-poos the fastest car in a straight line kind of argument, doesn't it? I mean, I think that's pretty comprehensive. Um, argue with me if you will, but that's the facts and the official figures from the weekend with the speed trap. So how else could that car be as quick as it is? Well, the driver could be absolutely exceptional. I mean, we have seen um, Ash Sutton and his engineer manage to set up cars to a point where he is 100% confident in that car and he just gets that, it only needs to be 1% in British touring cars, sometimes less than 1% in British touring cars. If you look at these times, for instance, um, less than 1% is quick enough in British touring cars to make a difference. And it only needs to be that confidence, driving ability and engineering ability and a bloody good pre-season. We've got to remember that both Ash Sutton and Dan Kamish, who, by the way, um, are both the best performing in their team, um, by a little margin, they were both signed up before anybody else in that team. Um, so they had both they had both more time in the car, um, officially, and they probably both have pretty banging engineers behind at the helm to sort out how you set up these cars for each track, and it could just be the fact that Ash Sutton is a mega driver. Also, that's one side of it. The other side of it could be internal components of the car which they've nailed. Um, you might not see top speed being the major part of the car which because you can also see Camish is quite down quite far down the order until later on and um, with the top speeds I mean Osborne seems to be the quickest on his setup so he obviously enjoys the straight line speed um, but it seems like Sutton and Camish and Robottom maybe enjoy more of the low end boost so this is what people talk about when they think that someone's been fiddling with a few computers and making some cars quicker than other I get that, that they must think that it goes on um, and there's no way I can prove whether it does or doesn't but it just doesn't make any sense for me to make one team or one car or one driver super quick and everybody else not. So, I mean, you could argue that, well, no, race line, is this race three? No, that's race, no, I'm on the wrong one, that's race seven. My point being that you do get um, components with anti-lag for the turbos which can kick in quicker. They might have nailed that working with the hybrids, um, which lets them go through uh, slow and medium corners quicker than anyone else. Um, but unless you've got that data, we can't ever know. So I think if the balance of performance is going to be tweaked slightly, we will see the rest of the team, the cars kind of catch up with Ash because he did kind of leave them all sitting far behind him um, in races one and two. So... We'll keep an eye on that one. I just thought it was worthwhile because he's getting a lot of flack. And the guy's only driving a car. He's driving the car to the best of his ability. And he's getting a lot of flack on it on social media. Um, he's got enough fans, I'm sure, to fight back. But there's no need to get toxic and absolutely delirious with all these conspiracy theories of how we've got... How many cars have we got on the grid just now? 27 cars on the grid. And for some reason we'd want to see one car or two cars be fantastically better than others i just don't i just don't take that point so i'd like to know everybody's um kind of opinion on ash and the napa racing ford is he going to run away with it um are we going to see turkington who's actually had a bit of better form recently come back into things um are the starlin civics going to start showing a bit of true pace what you know there's a few things are the toyota's going to catch up there's a lot of catching up to do ingram's shown good pace he was ill this weekend he showed very good pace and you can see actually through the timings that the hyundai is actually very quick in a straight line it's one thing that they've you know they've kind of prided they are very quick in a straight line so it just shows the difference in setup to these cars and the difference in where people are quick and that pearson there ingram chilton the three three fastest in a straight line are all the hyundai's or Hyundai's, um, as they should be called. And again, you're starting to see it. Halstead's there. He's up there. You know, Halstead and Ingram. So it's interesting to see that cars are set up to be quicker in different parts of the track. 
that's why I think engineering, if they've absolutely nailed it, they've nailed it. So everybody's playing catch up, a little bit like Red Bull in F1. So enough of me absolute waffling about that. Um, I will go now to try and zip rid of that. And as if by magic, we'll have my driver of the day. Who is your driver of the day? It was close. I think Turkington came close. He had consistent finishes. Um, I think Camish drove well. Robottom drove well. I think a lot of drivers drove really well and were unlucky at stages throughout the weekend. Um, but I've put Butcher in there because I think he's outperformed the rest of the Toyota boys at the weekend. Um, and he always seems to be solid, uh, particularly around Snerton as well. Um, so he's there. He was there or thereabouts. So he's somewhere in my top three. Um, Cook, I've given him a slot basically because of his tenacity sticking with it, even though he had horrific luck in race one, I think it was, or race two. And he fought through, yeah, it was race two, race one and two. Um, and he's fought through the pack to get a, a fantastic finish in race three, which, you know, I think it is just worthy, worthy of the. Uh... Oh, God, I've clicked on something here, sorry. It's just worthy of the ass. Fifth, fifth place from whatever it was, 26 or whatever it was he was in. I just think it's a fantastic display. And, he, you know, he's one of these drivers who'll be frustrated because he'll want to be up beside his good mate, Ash. But I've gave Ash that a number one driver because I just think, watch that car go through the corners. And I think he was an exceptional drive. Um, but yeah, I think that's about it for today. So I want to know your opinions on track limits. And... Ash Sutton or Napa Racing's Ford. And, oh, actually, I forgot to say, WSR. What are they doing? All cars on the grid surrounding each other for race three, all on the same compound. Why was there not a discussion at some point during that day to mix up the cars' compounds in a couple of the races? I know nobody's going to be want to be that person, but do they draw straws? Do they do something? Because they were all barging and colliding into each other and they were in front of the BMW boss um, who was at Snetterton at the weekend and it just doesn't look good for them, does it? It, it doesn't come out across well if you've got four BMWs um, battering into each other uh, around Snetterton when uh, you've got a couple of Fords running away with it. So what's your opinion on WSR? Should there be some sort of team rules? And there I know that Jake Hill's almost an independent driver within the WSR setup. But surely, if you're all on the same tyre choice in the last race, and you're all gunning for that last race, there's got to be some sort of tactics implemented early in the day, to pre when, especially when you've got three compounds on the go, to stop you all being on the same compound for the final race. Or having some sort of order where everybody behaves. But we all know that racing drivers don't like to behave. So on that bombshell... I'll thank you for watching and I'll see you on the next one. Oh, actually, we're only at 87, 87 subscribers. I told you that we'll be giving away the signed Aidan Moffat and framed Aidan Moffat poster from Croft in 2015 if we can get up to 100 subscribers. So please subscribe, please like and share if you want as well. Cheers.